Thanks, Susanna, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, like Susanna said, I'm a software developer on JAX, and I'm super excited to kick off these talks for the Community Week and get you started with JAX on Cloud TPUs. So this talk is mostly going to consist of a demo go, going over some JAX basics running on a Cloud TPU VM. And this might be a terrible idea, but I'm going to try to set up this demo completely from scratch to hopefully show you uh, just how easy it is to get started with JAX on TPU. So wish me luck. Um, so with that, I'm actually going to dive right in and create a demo VM that we can use so we can have that starting while we go over some slides. So I'm going to switch over to my GCP dashboard and go into the uh, Compute Engine TPUs tab. And then uh, I already have some TPUs running, but I'm going to create a new one for this demo by hitting Create TPU Node. Um, that failed to load, great. This is how you know it's a live demo, great. So I am gonna call this demo VM, pick my favorite zone, US Central 1A. Um, we are gonna opt into the new TPU, TPU VM architecture. I'll talk more about this in a minute. Um, we are going to stick to a modest eight uh, TPU cores, V3 TPU cores, and pick V2 alpha. This is always what you choose when creating a JAX TPU VM. So let's get that creating. OK, sometimes this takes uh, a minute or two. So I am going to, in the meanwhile, switch over to some slides and give you some basics on TPUs um, and how you can use them with JAX. So to start, um, just in case you're not familiar, what are cloud TPUs? So pictured here is a single TPU v3 board. And the board has four individual chips on it. And each TPU chip has two cores each for a total of eight TPU cores. And then this board is just plugged into a regular CPU host, very similarly to how you might plug a GPU into a machine. Um, so what makes the cloud TPU system special and more than just a box with some chips attached to it are the two key features you can see on this slide. So the first key feature is uh, high-speed interconnects, which are basically high bandwidth communication links between the cores, so the cores can talk directly to each other without going through the host. Um, and the second is basically the power of compilers. So TPUs were designed to be targeted by a compiler, specifically by the XLA compiler. Um, so if you compare this to other platforms that rely more on uh, pre-compiled kernels, that are invoked in something more like an interpreter loop. Um, when you run on a TPU, everything is compiled, uh, and this lets us drive the TPU cores more effectively. OK, so what makes cloud TPUs, or TPUs in general, really cool is that they're also designed to be scaled out into a TPU pod supercomputer. So now, instead of just four chips on a single board, a cloud TPU pod is 1,024 chips for a total of 2,048 cores attached to hundreds of CPU hosts. Um, and this is really scalable because we have those same two key features. So the same high-speed interconnects that connected those four chips now connect all the chips in the entire pod. Uh, and similarly, the XLA compiler can also scale to cover this entire pod. Uh, so you can use XLA to compile for a single core, a single board, or the entire pod, uh, or anything in between. OK, so what do these two key features actually get you? Um, so with the high-speed interconnects, you basically get easy communication scaling. Uh, you don't need to worry about the data center network topology. Everything kind of just works as you scale it out. Um, and with the compiler magic, you get a ton of cool compiler optimizations, uh, a few of which are listed here, but there are many more, I'm sure. Um, 
Uh, but another cool thing about using a compiler-based system for research in particular is that um, often when you're doing research, you're writing new code or new algorithms that no one has ever tried before. That's what makes it research. Um, so there's probably not an efficient handwritten kernel for all of the things you're trying to do. Um, so instead of writing your own kernel or maybe waiting for someone else to catch on and write a kernel, you can let the compiler do that work for you uh, and all the code you write can be optimized and super efficient. Okay, so we think that JAX is a particularly good fit for TPUs uh, because JAX itself is compiler oriented. Um, uh, and this means that JAX was designed from the ground up around the XLA compiler. And then, you know, XLA was designed around TPUs, so JAX and TPUs are a good fit. Um, the implications of being compiler oriented is that uh, a few things listed here. The first is that all operations uh, run through the compiler. So you always get that compilation benefit, everything you do in JAX. Um, so besides the nice performance benefit of this, another nice feature, which is the second bullet point, is that um, all JAX code can be run on CPU, GPU, or TPU with no code changes, just by targeting different platforms using XLA. Uh, so there are a few exceptions to this edge compiler features that just haven't been implemented on all platforms yet. But so this is more of a implementation issue than a fundamental design or API issue. Uh, and then finally, being compiler oriented means that you have full control over the compiler. So we'll see more of this in the demo, but basically JAX gives you a direct interface to what's compiled, all wrapped up in a nice, easy to use Python package. Okay, so just to give a little quantitative evidence for JAX and TPUs being a good match, uh, here are some benchmark results from last year. So these are from the MLPerf benchmark, which is an industry standard benchmark competition, and it's designed to fairly compare the performance of different ML hardware and software systems uh, with everyone on equal footing, because everyone's running the same models uh, on the same data sets to the same accuracy. So you can see in these charts that JAX on TPUs is very competitive. I believe we set a few world records, which was really exciting. Um, and I don't want to get into too much detail here, but one thing you might note is that we're not comparing equal number of chips in every column. So for example, down here in the, in the BERT section, uh, JAX is running on about 4,000 chips and PyTorch is running on about 2,000 A100s. So what's going on here is that we're comparing the largest and fastest submissions from each platform. So these results actually demonstrate the two advantages uh, of TPUs that we mentioned earlier. Uh, basically, the specialized high-speed interconnect allows the TPU submissions to scale usefully to more chips. And then the XLA compiler let us squeeze as much performance as possible out of each chip. Um, even though the TPU v3 is actually released, I think, like two years before the A100. So that's how we were able to get running so fast on so many chips. Um, oh, something I forgot to mention. So these numbers were produced on internal Google TPUs, not on cloud TPUs. So this is like the same chips, but with different software on top. Um, and until recently, there wasn't a way to access cloud TPUs in a way that you could reasonably run a high performance workload like this. But luckily, now you can um, enter cloud TPU VMs. So this is basically a, a new way to access cloud TPUs where you have a VM running directly on the TPU host. So this makes things pretty simple because you just have SSH access to the TPU host VM and you can run anything you want, like JAX code. Um, you can also run PyTorch or TensorFlow, uh, random Python code, C++, whatever. It's really just a regular VM that happens to have some TPUs attached to it. Um, and then here's just a picture showing that, of course, this scales up to pods. Um, 
in this case, when you're running on a pod or a pod slice, which is a subset of a pod, you just have more hosts. And so that's more VMs that you connect to. But again, you can run whatever you want on these pod VMs. Um, OK, so this is the final slide before we uh, hopefully get the demo working. And I just wanted to give a very quick overview of what JAX looks like before diving into the demo. So here's an example of some JAX code. Um, and if you've used NumPy before, this might look familiar. So here in the middle, we're defining a kind of fully little fully connected neural net, and we have a matching loss function. And so the difference is that instead of using NumPy, we're using jax.numpy, uh, which we're going to call JNP. And so what this gets you is that, um, like I said, JAX was built directly on top of the XLA compiler. And so all of this NumPy code or JAX NumPy code runs directly on an accelerator. Uh, so a GPU, a TPU, or on CPU if you don't have access to an accelerator or a prototyping on your laptop or something like that. Um, so out of the box, we get accelerated NumPy. But at the bottom here, uh, you can also see we have some function transformations. Uh, so I'm going to go over these in detail in the demo, but just to give you a taste, we're going to do some things like taking gradients, doing some just-in-time compilation, uh, doing a VMAP, whatever that is. Uh, okay, so with that, let's jump back and see how our demo VM is doing. It looks like it's up. Okay, now I have to do a complicated operation where I switch to a terminal window. So let me stop sharing this. Let me create a new terminal. Bear with me. OK, um, someone yell if you cannot see this terminal. So uh, I'm going to, I have some of these pre written, but hopefully these commands will make sense. Um, hopefully everyone can read this. So first, we're going to use the gcloud command to SSH into the new demo VM we created. And the interesting thing here is I'm going to add, this is a standard SSH flag to set up port forwarding so that um, I'm going to start a Jupyter notebook on the TPU VM, and I want to be able to load that notebook on my laptop. So I found the easiest way to do this is with port forwarding. Um, so. Uh, Gcloud is nice because it automatically sets up all your keys for you. OK, so now we are running on the TPU VM. Next, I'm going to install JAX. Uh, so if you've used JAX before, we've actually recently updated our install command. So this is pulling in all the dependencies you need, including JAXlib. So once this finishes, we should be all set up to use JAX. Next, I'm going to set up the demo notebook. So this uh, is still in my JAX fork on GitHub. I promise I will check this in. Um, but for now, we're going to be looking at my fork. And then let's install a few dependencies to actually run a Jupyter notebook, and we'll do some plotting. OK, it's complaining that these new notebook binaries are not on our path. So I'm going to put that on my path. And then finally, hopefully this works, let's start our Jupyter notebook. Great. I'm going to open that. OK, let me switch back to that window. Uh, one second. I think it's this one. OK, hopefully everyone can see I'm in my Jupyter notebook now. Um, and so I am going to open the notebook I prepared. Awesome. OK, so hopefully this works. I think I'm going to have to move pretty fast. But to start, we're just going to go over um, JAX as accelerated NumPy. So I'm going to import JAX.NumPy as JMP, just like the slide, and I'm going to create a 5,000 by 5,000 matrix. 
X. So this thing should act just like regular NumPy. I can run operations, I can slice, I can print values. But if we take a closer look, we see this is not in fact a regular NumPy array, but a device array. So what this means is that this value is stored in device memory. So in this case, uh, in TPU core memory on my TPU VM. Um, and all the operations we run, run on TPU. So the dot, the slice, everything happens on the TPU and we only bring the value back to the host if we need to print it or write it to disk or something like that. But uh, other than that, there should be- oh, Sorry to interrupt you. Would it be possible to zoom in a bit? Definitely, thank you. Thank you. How's that? Looks good, thank you. Okay, so other, uh, we have a device array, but we can treat it just like a regular NumPy array, so we can plot it. Uh, Matplotlib is a little bit slow. Uh, we can run more operations. We can do fancy NumPy indexing. Uh, so to demonstrate that this truly is running on my TPU VM, I'm gonna do a quick micro benchmark where I'm going to create the same array as a regular NumPy array, uh, and we can time a dot product, and we see it runs about 153 milliseconds per dot operation. Not bad for NumPy. But if we run the same benchmark using JMP dot dot with our device array, we see that it runs much faster, uh, just under six milliseconds per dot product. So turns out TPUs are pretty good at this. Um, OK, so this gives us NumPy running on our cloud TPU VM. So that's already pretty cool. But let's dive into those JAX uh, function transformations that we saw in the slide. So the first transformation I'm going to go over is automatic differentiation. Uh, JAX supports a lot of different types of AD, but I'm just going to focus on your kind of bread and butter reverse mode AD, which in JAX is called grad. So here is a little toy function F that we can play with and differentiate. So we have some control flow doing some uh, operations. And this is how we take the gradient of F in JAX. So all function transformations in JAX have a similar API where the transform takes a function as input and then returns a new function as output. So in this case, we pass in F as input, and then this returns the gradient function of F as output. So if we apply the gradient function to some value, uh, we get the gradient value out. And what's cool about this kind of uh, function transform API is that it's composable, meaning that you can take the output of one function transform and pass it right back in to another function transform as input. So this is how we're going to achieve higher order uh, gradients in JAX. We just take the output of um, that first grad call, which is the first order gradient, and pass it right back into grad to get the second order gradient, which we can then apply to a value, and so on and so forth uh, for higher order gradients. Uh, OK, so this is all I'm going to go over for grad, but we're really just scratching the surface here. Um, JAX supports a number of other types of AD, and you can learn all about this in the JAX Autodiff cookbook in our documentation. So the next transform I'd like to go over is called JIT for just-in-time compilation. So remember that everything so far has been running on the TPU and running with XLA. But we've only been uh, running a single operation at a time. That's kind of how JAX works by default. Uh, we call this op by op mode, also called eager mode. Um, JIT lets us take full advantage of XLA, which is like this really awesome full program optimizing compiler um, by staging out entire functions to compile with XLA instead of just one tiny operation at a time. So let's see how this looks. Um, so here's another toy function that we can try to compile. Uh, so we're going to call this f. Of course, we can run f uh, just as is. We get some values out. Uh, but this is running in op by op mode. So now let's make a new function g um, that's going to be the jitted version of f. And so uh, jit has a similar API to grad, where it takes a function in and returns a new function out. But this time, instead of changing what the function computes, 
it's going to change how the function is executed. So you can see that g of x, if you kind of match up these numbers, produces the same value as f of x. But what's different about it is that g of x is going to stage out this whole function and compile the entire function using XLA. So in order to see this, let's do another micro benchmark. So first, we're going to time f of x, which is the op by op non-compiled mode. We get about 21 milliseconds per iteration. So if we look at g of x, I think it's running it like a million times. OK. Yeah, so order uh, over an order of magnitude faster when running the compiled version. So that's a really nice speed up in this case. Um, and just to give you an idea of the kinds of things that XLA can do in order to get this speed up, um, one thing is it can fuse operations together. Um, so instead of each of these being a separate op that we dispatch, it's all one big operator. And then we're only returning a slice of the output in this example. And so XLA is smart enough to not even do the work it doesn't need to do uh, in order to produce this output, plus a bunch of other optimizations. Um, so uh, JIT is also composable. Uh, so here we have JIT and GRAD composed many times. It works just fine. Um, this is kind of a silly example in real life. You wouldn't actually call JIT twice like this on the same function. Um, like you don't get twice the speed up by calling JIT twice. But this kind of composability does come in handy. Uh, for instance, when you're writing library code, you can JIT de uh, decorate functions in your library and then users can just call those functions however they want. They can call grad, they can call JIT. Uh, on top of it, it, it's all fine. And it also becomes more interesting when you have more bits of code in between these different uh, composed transforms. OK, hopefully so far so good. Um, I'm going to move on to the next transform, which is called VMAP. So this one might be less familiar, um, but it's actually pretty simple, hopefully. Um, VMAP is very similar to a Python map. So you can see we pass a function as input, um, and we're going to get a function as output as usual. Uh, and how this works is that the output function, uh, so say that this lambda here takes a scalar. We'll call this a scalar function. The output function is going to take a whole vector of inputs and then run this square function on each element of the input. So it's basically mapping over the input and applying this function. Uh, that's what the vmapped function does. Um, OK, so we could have done this you know, with like a Python map or probably a for loop. Why use vmap? And what's interesting is the way that vmap achieves this mapped result. And it does it via vectorization. Uh, thus VMAP, meaning that it's going to take all the operations in the input function and turn them into vectorized versions of the same operations. Um, another way to think about this is that VMAP adds a batch dimension to your function. And so it turns this single example function into a batched function. Um, so in order to try to see this, I am going to use another transform called make Jaxper. And make Jaxper basically gives us a view of uh, the input function as Jax sees it. So the details aren't super important here, but the idea is that if we call make Jaxper on dot and then pass it to vectors, so this is going to be a vector vector dot, you can see we get this one dot general operation out. And the details aren't super important, but like basically this tells you that it's a vector vector dot. But this kind of operation can do lots of different dot-like things. Um, OK, so now let's look at the Jaxper for vmap of dot. And since we're adding that new mapped dimension, we're going to pass in two matrices instead of two vectors. Uh, but we can see that the VMAP operation is still just a single dot general. So this is basically going to be a matrix matrix dot instead of a vector vector dot. And we efficiently do this in a single operation. Um, and so on and so forth. We can keep calling VMAP. Um, each time it's going to add a new dimension to our input, but we still just get this single dot general operation. Um, so 
that's all I'm going to say about VMAP, but uh, this is a very toy example. You can imagine, um, you know, when you plug this into a bigger function, uh, it can save you a lot of time and simplify your code by uh, automatically adding all these vectorized operations. Okay. Um, the next transform I'm going to go over is called PMAP. Um, and so, like I said, everything so far has been running on the TPU, but we've only been running on a single TPU core. So by default, all Jack's code runs on a single device, in this case, a single core. Um, but like we saw in the slides, a TPU VM actually comes with an entire board with eight cores total. So if we look at Jack's.devices, uh, we can actually see we have eight TPU devices available to us on our VM. So how do we take full advantage of all eight TPU cores here? Um, that's where we can use PMAP. So PMAP, uh, as the name implies, is very similar to VMAP. In fact, it has exactly the same API. So uh, we pass a function in and we get a mapped or batched version of the function out. Um, the difference is how PMAP computes that mapped result. So if we take a look at the result, um, what's going on here is that PMAP, instead of vectorizing, is going to parallelize. So we take this function that we want to map, and it's going to split up the input and send each element to a different TPU core and each TPU core will compute its result over uh, its slice of the input. And then so our output is this thing called a sharded device array. So what this means is that each of these output um, elements is stored on a different TPU core. Um, but this thing otherwise acts just like a regular NumPy array or just like a device array. So we can run some operations on it. It works just fine. Um, one thing I want to go over that trips people up a lot is that we have this sharded device array Y that came out of our PMAP. Um, and we can just run normal NumPy operations on it. But as soon as we start running operations on it outside of a PMAP, we're going to go back to that single core execution mode. So you can see the output of this operation is a device array again because basically what happened is it collected all these values back onto a single core in order to um, do the division operation. So basically the rule is that any operations by default um, are happening on a single core unless they're happening in a PMAP. And then that's how you know if it's running parallelized or single core. Okay, um, but going back to the sharded device array, this kind of um, is similar to the device array in that because we're storing these values uh, sharded across multiple cores, we can avoid communication and only do the minimum amount of communication and work needed. Uh, and we do this by stringing together many PMAPed operations, or uh, alternatively, you can just PMAP a larger function. But just for the points of demonstration, let's take a look at this example. So what we're doing here is using PMAP to create a 5,000 by 5,000 matrix on each TPU core. So we're going to get eight matrices total stored as a sharded device array. We can then um, perform a parallelized dot to dot each, each matrix with itself. So this is each core is going to individually do a dot. Uh, we can then take a mean of the result on each core, again, using PMAP and then print the total result of this mean. So the only communication that happens here is sending the final mean back to the host for printing. Otherwise, everything happens independently on each core. And we can try to see this via a micro benchmark. So here, I'm just going to do this single device dot. Uh, this is similar to what we did earlier. So yeah, just under six milliseconds per dot. And so now if we do eight dots in parallel using PMAP, um, you can see that there's only a slight overhead to doing the eight dots, but certainly much, much better than eight times the single device version. Okay, 
So that tells us how to do work on each TPU core. But like I mentioned, we have these special high-speed interconnects that allow the cores to talk directly to each other. So how do we take advantage of that in JAX? Um, that's where these collective communication operations come in. So we model this in JAX with collectives. Um, and what collectives basically do is let you break the map abstraction and do an operation across the mapped axis that you're adding with PMAP. Uh, so the simplest example of this is PSUM. Um, as the name implies, this is going to do a sum across all of the cores, across all that mapped axis that PMAP is adding. So to give an example of this, here's a function where, um, remember, so this x is the input to each, uh, each core, each slice of the map, and we are going to compute a normalized version of x by um, summing together all the x's across uh, all the mapped axis and then dividing each individual input by this total. And I'm also returning the total so that we can see what this looks like. Um, so you can see here that we get all our normalized values out and then the total itself is going to be um, each core gets its own copy of the total. So that's why we get uh, eight copies of the total here. Um, okay, uh, so you might notice this axis name. Um, this is basically when we, like PMAP is adding a new batch axis is one way to think about it. We can give a name to that axis. And then when we do a collective operation, we specify that name to say which axis um, we want to do that operation over. And so this is not very interesting when there's only one PMAP and one axis name, but it gets more interesting when you have multiple PMAPs with multiple axis names. Um, so I want to make sure we have time for questions now. So I'm not going to go over this in detail, but basically you can specify different axis names in order to do different um, individual sums. Like we can sum across rows or sum across columns or sum everything. All right, I have one more transform that I wanted to go over before ending this talk. Um, so I really don't have time to go over this in detail, I think, but I'm going to try to go over it really fast and still leave time for questions. So this is a new experimental transform, meaning that we're still working on it. It might change as we develop it, but I thought it might be interesting to take a look and see what it can do. So this is called PGIT. And PGIT is another way to take advantage of multiple devices and parallelize across devices. Um, but instead of, uh, it basically takes another view of the computation than PMAP does. So PMAP kind of takes a per device view of the computation. Like we specify the function that we want to run on each device and then manually include collective operations when we want there to be uh, communication between devices. PGIT, you give it a global view of the computation, like the computation you want to run across all devices, and it automatically splits it up across the devices and adds communication as necessary. So for an example, um, we can do a convolution operator. Um, so this might be useful, say you're doing a convolutional neural net, and you want to feed it image examples that are so large that a single example doesn't even fit on a single device. You can use PGIT to automatically split up that convolutional net uh, and run across multiple devices. So here we're just going to focus on the conv operator. Um, here I give an example that is very small and does fit on one device. So we can see uh, that that works just fine. Um, with PGIT, it works somewhat similarly to JIT. So like instead of doing a map, it's more like JIT, where we pass in our function that we want to PGIT, and we get a parallel version of the same function out. So um, this should ideally get the same response, or sorry, the same result, just like JIT. But um, it's actually running a parallel version that runs across multiple devices. So you can see in our micro benchmark, this is running the single core conv in about 45 milliseconds. 
And then when we use the PGITed parallel version of Khan, we get about a 5x speed up. So that's pretty good for running across eight devices. And uh, you get 5x instead of 8x because there is some communication overhead, so you can't get perfect scaling. Um, OK, yeah, I'm not going to go over the details of how to actually invoke PGIT, but if you are interested to learn more about that, um, yeah, maybe ask a question in the Slack channel or hit me up later. I'd love to talk more about it. Um, so with that, that's all I have prepared, and I would love to stop now for questions. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks so much, Sky. Super interesting. Uh, we had a lot of good questions and discussion in the chat. Uh, if you want to, you can keep your slides on. Maybe we go back and forth. Mm -hmm. We have just a few minutes. Um, I just want to let everybody know in case, and we're probably not going to go through uh, all of the questions um, due to time constraints, but feel free to also send Slack, uh, send questions um, to Slack. Um, okay, let's start with maybe from the beginning, while you're working on GCP, can the same be run? Can the same project be run on Kaggle TPU or Google TPUs? Or does it require some different uh, installation of libraries? OK, that's a good question. Sorry, I'm like way behind in the chat, so I can't actually read no it worries. myself because I can't. Um, uh, so like I mentioned, TPU VMs are like a new TPU architecture that was recently released. Um, some platforms, in particular Colab, and I think also Kaggle, which I think uses a similar notebook setup to Colab, um, are still on the old architecture. So you can still use JAX with these, um, but you're not going to get um, as like there's some performance overheads and usability issues. Uh, I didn't go over the details between the two architectures, but so just to be aware that unless you do use a GCP TPU VM, you are probably on the old architecture and it won't be exactly the same experience, but it's, it's still jacks on TPUs. Right, and for, for some of the questions Avital also answered, uh, I'll just anyway, uh, maybe read them out to you. Uh, what is the difference between grad and JIT? Is that a question? Yeah. Uh, the difference between grad and JIT, I mean, they do different things. So grad will return the gradient function of its input, and JIT doesn't take the gradient at all. It just um, returns a compiled version of the function. And when would you not use JIT? And Avita answered that uh, you will probably always want to use JIT, other than if you're debugging. OK, yeah, that's such a good question. Something I skipped in this talk, but if you check out our documentation, um, I think in the JAX 101 tutorial, there is a section on JIT that goes over this. Um, there are some constraints to using JIT. Um, like you can't JIT literally all of your Python code and have it run faster. Um, so yeah, I think the answer is you would always use JIT when you can. But if you look at that tutorial, you'll see that sometimes you have to break your logic up into smaller JIT blocks. Um, yeah, one constraint is around control flow. Um, some control flow can be JITed like if and while loops, but sometimes it can't. So you can learn more about that in the docs. That's a good question. Cool, and maybe related to that, if you, if you would only apply it to uh, primitive functions or end-to-end, -end, so matrix multiplication versus full policy gradient update, and um, yeah, probably to the entire training step. Um, oh yeah, so that's a good point too. I guess another situation you wouldn't JIT is if you're just running a single operation anyway. So like in that conv benchmark I just showed at the end, I didn't use JIT because I'm just running one operation. So yeah, usually you want to JIT as big a block as you can to give XLA um, as much to work with as it can. So yeah, it's very common for people to JIT their entire training step and then to like drive that from a Python while or for loop. Um, occasionally people even JIT the entire training loop, but that can sometimes get more complicated uh, due to the control flow constraints I mentioned earlier. 
Okay, we have a lot of questions. I, I moved down. <laughs> I moved down a bit, but uh, yeah, let me just say that again. You feel free to to also post your questions on Slack. Um, does JAX have a named tensor feature? PMAP seems to be something similar, but it seems exclusive exclusive to to MAP. And does JAX have a tensor annotation feature? Yeah, I think Avi Avi Tal mentioned this in the chat. Yeah. We are working on the new XMAP transform, which I didn't have time to demo this time. Uh, that's even more under development than PJ, but yeah. The big idea there is kind of introducing named axes in a named axes programming model. Um, yeah, I think we have an XMAP tutorial online if you want to learn more about that, but that is very likely to change moving forward. Is there any tool akin to uh, NVIDIA SMI to see what the TPU cores are doing and if I'm making good use of the available memory while training? That's a great question. Um, so there are profiling tools for TPU. Uh, they're built as a TensorBoard plugin. Um, again, if you look at the JAX documentation, there's a page on profiling that shows you how to get set up with this. Um, so it's kind of a little heavier weight than NVIDIA SMI. Like it's not just the command line tool. It's more like a full profiling tool. Um, but that gives you uh, like a view of um, all the operations that are happening and how long they're taking. I think that you can get a view of the memory usage. Um, we definitely have that internally and I think it works in the cloud DPU version as well. Um, so I would definitely check out the TensorBoard profiling plugin and you can look at that on the JAX documentation. Awesome, I think we also link to, to JAX documentation and I'll make sure I'll share the relevant links as well later on. Um, I think that's all for, for questions um, for now, at least, um, and we can move to Slack. Thank you so much, Sky. This was uh, super interesting. Um, and yeah, yeah, thank you. And thanks, everyone. And yeah, please, I think it'll probably be easiest if I didn't answer your question to CC me in Slack, because I'm not sure I'm going to make it through this whole chat window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll try. It's a lot. Thank you so much, Sky. Um, OK, then I think we can maybe stop sharing and uh, move on to the next talk. And um, whenever Mark is ready, we can maybe start sharing. Yes, just let me um, share my screen. All right, can you see this? Yes, looks good. Uh, though your video, we can't see your video, but it's up to you. If you want oh, okay. To um, I think it stopped. Okay, can you see yeah. it now? Looks good, thanks. Okay. Okay, so let's get started. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> my name is Mark van Zee, uh, and I'm a, a software engineer uh, at the Flex team. And today I'm gonna give an uh, introduction to Flex. Um, so the audience for this talk is, is a general machine learning interested audience. Um, it's a beginner's talk, but it does require some background ground knowledge on basic machine learning terminology, like um, feed forward neural networks, batch normalization, or uh, automatic differentiation. The content of this talk consists of three parts. Um, first, I'm gonna give a background uh, uh, about Flex and Jax, then um, talk a bit about our ecosystem philosophy, and then I'm, uh, we're going to go into the Flex code and uh, look at, at, at our main abstraction, which co are called the Flex modules. Unfortunately, I'm not going to give uh, demos, all the cool demos that Sky gave. So uh, this for me is going to be just slides, unfortunately. OK, background. Um, yeah, so Flex is a neural networking library and ecosystem built on JAX. And we specifically call ourselves an ecosystem um, because we care about the ecosystem in, in two ways. Uh, first, um, we want to make sure that uh, our library has good open source support. So we have a lot of examples. Um, we make sure our examples run on cloud TPU. Uh, we have a lot of how-tos. And also we develop with an open source first approach. Um, so we develop based on GitHub issues and uh, our GitHub discussions are very active. Uh, but on the other hand, um, we also uh, curate recommendations for other libraries built on top of JAX. So it is our view that um, we don't want Flex to be a monolithic library built on top of JAX, but rather they should be in a, a collection of libraries that, that work well together. So that's why we, we serve our users. Um, so we want to guarantee that users can uh, use all their libraries to do their projects. And 
I'll talk about this a bit more later. Okay, here's just some flex numbers. Um, within Alphabet, um, we're now the most commonly used neural networking library for JAX. Um, and uh, we have 187 dependent projects and 97 uh, collaborators. And Hugging Face um, imports really a lot of flex models, more than 4,000. So um, that's also nice. So um, Sky just gave a really great introduction to JAX. Um, so please take a look at that as well. Uh, but maybe people that just tuned in and they haven't seen it, I'll just have one slide explaining JAX again. Um, so JAX, people say JAX is Autograd, Autograd and XLA. Those are immediately two new terms. Um, so Autograd is um, basically saying that JAX can automatically differentiate, differentiate uh, Python code, so your Python functions. So you can write a Python function, and um, there's this uh, this transformation called grad, which is a, a JAX transformation, and and you can pass this Python function to grad, and um, JAX will will create um, and it will differentiate this function, uh, so it differentiate through loops and uh, all kinds of things, um, and then JAX is also XLA, so um, you can you um, you can actually JIT compile um, your own Python functions into XLA optimized kernels. Um, so you do this, and then because you generally uh, JIT large computations, like um, Sky also explained in her talk, you give XLA all the information it needs to find uh, the optimal way to execute it. And then XLA will um, optimize it uh, to get the best performance depending on the accelerator. Um, yeah, so another way of looking at this um, is that JAX is an um, extensible system for composable function transformations. So these functions JIT, PMAP, and GRAD, they are all function transformations. And that means you input a function and uh, this function transformation will return a new function. Um, and an important part is that JAX uses a functional API. So it means that it only guarantees correct behavior when you are using or you are inputting functions, functions without side effects. Um, so typically side effects are the result of mutating an object that lives outside the function. And this functional API is a reason why XLA can do such a good job optimizing it. So here are just uh, two example compositions. You can uh, JIT grad, which is what you usually do when you do standard gradient descent, or you can VMAP and grad. And uh, that is a way to get per example gradients um, and you get it very efficiently because if you want to do it uh, naively, you have to use a batch size of one, which is pretty slow. Okay, now the world already has TensorFlow and PyTorch uh, and, and there's little need to build a clone of either of them. Um, but we believe that uh, the, func the composable function transformation approach that JAX takes opens up new frontiers for making neural net code more maintainable, more scalable, and also more performant than existing libraries. So I just listed some examples here, uh, but there are many more. Um, so using JAX, you can write models as a sing single example code, and you can introduce batching automatically with VMAP. So you just input your entire, uh, uh, all your examples in one array, and it will, you, it will batch automatically. You can also automatically handle record batches using uh, masking. And you can um, create efficient compile time and runtime models um, or remove memory head headaches by uh, using easy rematerialization or reversibility. For instance, the, the reformer was also uh, based on JAX. And lastly, but not least, it's, it's really fast. Um, if you, there's a, there's a, so Hugging Face recently created a number of really amazing scripts where they um, they train some flex models and then they do some comparisons and they are really fast. For instance, you can pre-train BERT in under 18 hours and, and using uh, the cloud TPUs that's less than $150, which is, uh, which is quite, uh, quite cheap. Okay, so now let's just take a preview of, uh, of Flex. Um, Flex builds on top of JAX and it contains everything you need to do uh, your deep learning research. Here on the left, you see an example, um, but I will talk about the code in more detail later. So it doesn't matter if you don't get all the details. Um, our main abstraction is the module abstraction. Um, and it's pretty similar to the abstraction that you might know from TensorFlow and PyTorch, if you've used that. So um, 
we strive to offer an API familiar to those experienced with uh, those kind of libraries. But Flex is fundamentally a functional system for defining neural networks. So what I mean is that you write your modules in a uh, stateful or ob object-oriented way, as you can see in this example. Um, this is this is a class which is with it, with a with a state. Um, in order to operate with JAX transformations, we must expose pure a pure function. So like I said before, JAX uses pure functions and we cannot just construct this, this MLP and pass it to a JAX transformation, that wouldn't work. So instead we should create a stateless or pure function from our modules that we can use with JAX transformations. And this also allows you to compose them like you can in JAX. And therefore modules come with two functions that, you, uh, that return a state rather than maintaining a state, init and apply. And here you see in the example, uh, we have an MLP, a multi-layered perceptron that's created. Um, and then um, first you, you construct your model and then uh, you call model.init. And that is actually how you initialize your parameters. And there you see the parameters are returned and they are not stored in the model. And also when you call apply, the output is also returned. So um, this, is the, this is the way we build Flex. Um, but alternatively, you can of course also expose stateful functions. Um, but then you cannot use the JAX transformations directly. So this is what other libraries, for instance, uh, objects, they do that. And it also works, but it's not the philosophy you follow. Okay, so that's about the module abstraction. Um, also our RNG handling um, is an important feature of a flex. Um, so JAX uh, handles RNGs differently from NumPy because uh, NumPy's uh, RNG design, um, so the, the generating pseudo random numbers, uh, it, it makes it hard to, to guarantee a number of desirable properties for doing machine learning research. Um, so I, I won't go into the details here, but um, basically in NumPy, uh, the, the, the RNGs are based on a global state. And with JAX, you specifically provide uh, the state to your uh, random number generation. Um, so in, in Flex, the user also ex explicitly provides the RNGs when initializing or applying a module. However, you only have to do this at the top level. So as you see here, as an argument to the init function, we have checks.random.prng key zero, which is, a, which, which, which is used for creating, um, for, for initializing the parameters of your model. But it only has to be done at the top level. And then uh, Flex makes sure that, that this seed is split deterministically for all the submodules, like in this uh, this NLP, you have uh, a, a, a few dances that are um, automatically also then initialized. Um, so now um, we also have a number of utility functions, which are thin and decoupled. Um, in this sense, Flex comes with what we say batteries included. Um, we have a number of the, those to simplify your workflow. Um, but at the same time, we believe it's also a good feature um, that these can, then de can be decoupled and split off into separate libraries. Um, for instance, we recently switched our optimizers to use uh, another library, Optex, and I'll talk about that also a bit more uh, later. Um, we also maintain a number of ex examples um, and um, from different domains, and also talk about a bit more later. And then we have uh, some how-to guides and patterns explaining some of our design choices. Okay, so let me now talk a bit about uh, the Flex uh, ecosystem philosophy. Um, <clears throat> as anyone who's ever worked with JAX is probably well aware, uh, there have been many libraries built on top of JAX and they usually end with X, Flex, Objects, Tracks, and there's just really a lot of them. Um, and uh, while it can be a bit confusing, we believe that this is essentially not a bug, but it's a feature. Um, we believe it's actually very healthy to have a, a number of libraries built on JAX that interoperate. Um, and actually, we, we believe that this really plays well with the compositionality of JAX transformations that we talked about before. Um, so what we envision as Flex is uh, the JAX ecosystem as a set of decoupled libraries that are each individually well-maintained. And um, they follow these points that we, um, that we suggest. Um, so the first one is uh, minimize indirection. So we want to make it easy for users to navigate to the low level operations in their machine learning code. So we want to keep the control flow relatively simple and you, do, you don't have to pass a function that calls a function that calls a function or very deep subclassing. Those are the things we, we try to avoid. 
Secondly, we have a bias against inversion of control. We prefer duplicating code over abstractions that require many options. So simply put, we prefer to avoid abstractions like a trainer um, that capture common use cases and hyperparameters in the constructor arguments. So we, we actually believe that it's, it's, it's virtually impossible to consider all use cases. And, and keep, if you keep expanding, extending such abstractions with new options, that, that's a road that we don't want to go down to. And, I also think that in the past that has, has shown that, that this can lead to quite confusing APIs. Um, of course, we don't want to discourage anyone who would like to implement something like that on top of Flex, um, but we as the Flex team, we, we refrain from doing so. Um, the third, loosely, co loosely coupled libraries. Um, so this is comparable to the Unix philosophy. So just like in Unix, um, processes operate through streams and functions can be piped, um, that in, in JAX, Libraries inter interoperate by passing pure functions to each other. So pure functions are the lingua franca. Um, and for, uh, yeah, we care about error messages. We use slugs, with, uh, which are well documented. Um, five, the code should read out the math in the paper. It follows somewhat from the other points, um, but just want to stress that the math is what matters. Um, there should be few distractions from actually this math. And then we prefer separate libraries for separate needs but it's, it's more important that they are actively maintained and supported. Okay, so this is an example of, um, what, of a recent change in our, in our ecosystem. So um, in, in, as Flex, we use these flips, which, are flex, which is a Flex improvement process. So if someone ha wants to um, propose a large change, then they, they can create a flip and then we discuss it. Um, so we think this is a good example of healthy development. So we as Flex, we had our own optimizer module, which is flex.optim. Um, but we always felt that it did not work right. It, wasn't, it didn't really have a functional API. Um, but then we found that DeepMind actually built a dedicated library for optimizers called Optex, which is based on composable gradient transformations. And it is uh, very functional. It, is a, it uses a functional API. Um, so we actually believe that it works nicer than our own optimizers. So we, in, during this flip, um, we, we decided to switch to Optex. And now we recommend um, using Flex with Optex and most of our examples already are using uh, Optex now. And I'll also talk a bit more about how Optex work, works later in this talk. So here's um, a visualization of the JAX ecosystem that we recommend, we recommend as the Flex team. Um, there are of course libraries we don't mention here, so it is opinionated. Um, and we also only mention libraries that fit our, our philosophy. Like, and the most important thing is that they have to wor work well together with each other and they are well maintained. So at the bottom you see um, the JAX and then all the verticals that are built on top of that. So we have Flex for neural networks, uh, Optex for optimizers and losses, and then if you want to work on speci specialized domains, we have a number of libraries, um, OTT for optimal transport, uh, RLEX for reinforcement learning, and JRAF for um, graph neural networks. Um, then there's also JAX to TensorFlow, uh, which is a tool that is um, actually built by the JAX team. And, and it um, allows you to, to take a, a JAX graph and to directly convert it to a TensorFlow graph. And that basically allows you to export it to a safe model. And then you can use everything that the TensorFlow ecosystem has to offer, like for serving or for um, running your models on the web or in the browser. Um, there's also checks for testing. And um, we in Flex team, we also have the checkpoints that we use. And we also recommend using Clue, um, which is uh, called Common Loop Utils. And that is to simplify, simplify your training loop. So this is a list of some of our examples. And um, yeah, it, if you just want to get to know this, it's nice to look through it. Um, we started with MNIST, it's a very simple example and it's uh, just one file, I think. Um, then we also have Seek2Seek, which, which uses a recurrent neural network, an LSTM. Um, we have ImageNet, of course, ConvNets, it's very popular. Um, then we, ha we have actually a few transformer implementations. Um, WNT is, I think, our most advanced one. It's also, I think, uh, based, based on the ML perf results. So it, it uses some of those tricks. Um, then we have um, Pixel CNN uh, for uh, generating images. And we have PPO for, for reinforcement learning. And we have a bunch more examples. 
Okay, so that was um, about the Flex ecosystem. Let's now talk about Flex code, um, and specifically Flex linear modules. So in the past one, one and a half year, uh, we worked on the new, what we call the Linen API. So we, we had an API uh, before that, and this is kind of our, our second iteration on our API. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> and what we did, uh, we studied all the existing neural networking libraries built on top of Jax at the time. So for instance, tracks, objects, haiku. And then we tried to see what would be the best of, of, of all these uh, libraries and what we, what we think is best. Um, then we did a number of focus groups with uh, different groups of users. So uh, for instance, some users that really liked flags or people that really didn't like it. Um, and just to, and then we iterated on that further. So what we ended up is, is the Linen API. And I mean, we believe it's quite ergonomic and um, we tried to give a lot of flexibility while avoiding food guns and especially what we call the silent food guns. So that is for instance, that things happen and you find out really late. So. Um, some of your some of the parameters in your model were actually changed while you didn't want them to change. They were mutable, or um, you get a nan when after training really long, and then that's that can also be uh, APIs can also be a cause of that. And we try to avoid that as much as possible. Okay, so let's look at an overview of how these models are used, modules are used. So in the first step, you instantiate the module. So this module is just called model, uh, and we're going to look at plenty of examples later. Um, so now you instantiate it, um, and, but this will only construct uh, the module and not initialize any variables. Because remember that we, we don't want to store the state uh, of the parameters in the, in the module. Then to create initial variables, you call model.init. Um, and as a first argument, you pass the PRNG key for initializing all the parameters. Um, in, the, in this presentation, I probably call parameters often params as well, but it's the same. Uh, and you pass them, um, you pass them the inputs of your model. But uh, when you initialize, these inputs are only used uh, for the shapes. Then the parameters are created using initialize an initialization function uh, that is provided when you define them. I'll show it later. Okay, so now there's two ways of uh, of calling apply to your model. Um, the first is if you have no mutable state. So this is the default case. Um, this means that your model only contains parameters that, and they don't change when running the forward pass. And so then the model is just going to return outputs. And, and you see with 3a, there's also the function signature. You, you get the variables in and your um, input x, and it just returns your outputs y. Now, there's also plenty of cases where uh, you have actually a mutable state. You want to change some of your parameters while, while running the forward pass. So um, for instance, batch normalization. Um, now, because we want to have this functional API, we cannot store this state inside the model. So we should also return it. So in this case, apply will return a tuple and it will return your outputs and it will, will return the um, parameters that have been changed. And note, you also should pa pass the mutable keyword arguments to apply and you say which of these um, of your params are, um, which of your variables, which uh, collections are um, mutable. And then, Otherwise, if you don't do that, Flex will complain. Okay, now I'll explain these one, two, three A and three B separately with some code. Okay, so let's define a module. So this is a module called net that takes as input um, an image um, and it outputs a prob probability distribution over 10 classes. So let's start from the top. Uh, so you define um, model attributes, in this case units, you define it as you do in, uh, in a data class. So in fact, uh, Flex modules are also data classes, but they are a special kind because we add an optional parent and name attributes, but you keep, typically don't have to care about that. Um, now, there's actually two ways of defining modules. Um, this is the, the one way shown here, and that is you, you have a function set up and you have a function call. And this is the normal case, but there's also another way which we call the compact way, and I'll, I'll show that later. Um, but here you define them uh, in setup, and you might be wondering as a Python user, why is it not just called init? And that's because data classes, they take over init, and um, that's why we use setup, but you can treat it like init. So you just um, define all your submodules there. So in this case, in this code, we have uh, a confnet, um, and we have a fully connected layer, a dense. So it's self.con and self.fc. Now, when you want to run the forward pass in call, um, 
what we do is uh, you get the uh, your input X and you just run through the ConfNet. Then you have an uh, activation function. Then you reshape it and then you um, run it through the vec uh, fully collect connected layer, and it returns a log softmax over your classes. Um, so we we use a number of predefined uh, modules here, and what you also see is that we have automatic shape inference. So we don't make any assumptions about the shape of X. So that will be uh, automatically inferred when you when you construct uh, when you when you initialize the model with a specific shape. On the bottom right, you see um, the the parameter tree that's created. Um, so that's automatically created. It's just a dictionary, and um, the names of these uh, of these parameters are the same as you assign to self. So self.com is just conf. It's just in the parameter tree. It's conf. And that's the same as, as it's done in PyTorch. OK, so that's just um, how you define a normal one. And now I just have to hear the comparison between uh, non-compact and compact. So which you use is, is up to you. But um, let's first look at the differences. So with compact, you just have one function that you define, and you annotate it with nn.compact. And what you do here, you both um, uh, create uh, the modules and you call them uh, directly after each other. So you have your nn.conf um, and you then um, immediately apply x to it. And that's indeed very compact. Um, so which one of these two you uh, want to use uh, is up to you. Um, if you're using very large models, it may be, maybe you, you prefer using setup. Um, um, but we really like compact. We use it all the time and, and we believe there's a number of upsides. So. Um, for instance, if you have a model, I don't have an example here, but a model with loops. So suppose you want to create a number of layers, then you need this loop both in setup and in call. So that's, that's a bit redundant. And if you use compact, you only have to make one loop. Um, and also you, you're collocating uh, concerns. So everything is defined and used in one place. So uh, if you use the, the regular mode, then um, you, you're constantly switching between call and setup. And that, that can also get a bit annoying. And of course, compact is shorter. OK, so let's now initialize a model with model.init. Um, OK, so um, here we first uh, import uh, Jax's version of NumPy. Uh, as uh, Sky said, uh, Jax has his own NumPy. Um, and then we, we create a, a random key. Um, and then we create a shape. So inputs is a, is a, has a shape, and it's only once. Because like I said, when you call init, uh, it doesn't matter what the value of this is. Um, and then you construct, um, then you construct um, your uh, net, um, and then you call in it with the key and the inputs, and that will return your uh, your variables. Um, and now what I'm doing here, which is quite a nice trick, you can call jacks dot tree map, um, and which will um, apply everything to the leaves of your tree. So then, if you give it as the argument for your tree, you give it the parts. And as, as the function, you give it jmp.shape. It will print out the shapes of, of all your, of your leaves. So it's quite a compact way of, of viewing your parameters. Now, what this shows is what we also saw in the picture before. So we have um, a collection params. And, and params is what we use for all these uh, parameters that, that by convention are uh, immutable. But you can have more collections, as I will show later. Um, and now these names are generated automatically. So before we saw that they were called conf, but that was because you were using um, a setup and call. So there you have self.conf, and it, we knew it was called conf. But in this case, you're, you're not uh, assigning a, this uh, conf to anything. So we just generate a name, which is not based on anything. It's just a counter. Um, but you can always assign it a name yourself. If you want to, you, you can just use a keyword argument to, um, to conf uh, like name is. OK, now that we've um, created um, this module, let's uh, call apply on it um, to get the outputs. So what we do now at the top is, uh, is, a, is a trick that we, um, that, we, th that we often do. No, and that's not a trick. It's just like how you, how you deal with uh, Jack's random uh, numbers. If you need a new uh, uh, random uh, key, then you should split your existing one. Or you just create, you just create a new one. But usually, you just split it. So we, 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 in the previous uh, slide, we created this key. And now you call jaxlcrem.split, and then you get two keys back. And the last one, you, we just keep for reusing. And the first one is the new one we're going to use for input. And then we just create some fake input um, of, of the shape that we want. And then we call um, apply. Um, 
and we apply it. So we take our VARs, which is from init, and uh, we pass the input. And this will run it to the forward pass, and it, it returns indeed uh, um, this uh, array for each class. It gives you a, a log softmax, which is, of course, nonsense now because we didn't do any training. Um, yeah, so also a funny thing to notice is that we construct here a new net 10. Um, so basically, this, this is kind of like um, maybe a good example of the, of the the fact that we don't carry state so like basically every time you you want to call apply or init you can just as well create a new instance of this this uh, class because it doesn't have any state except what you pass to the constructor which is usually um yeah some arguments from your hyperparameters okay um okay so the examples before that uh, i talked about they all used um uh, params from predefined modules so we had uh, the conf nets uh, we had the dense uh, and then we saw that indeed we got this nice uh, param dictionary. But um, at some point you probably want to create your own params. And um, for this you use self.param in your module. Um, so here on the left you see an example. Um, so now the, we create a part of the dense and um, we use compact. And for the kernel we, we use self.param. And um, this, this requires three arguments. So the first one is a name, which, is, which will appear in the, um, in the dict. And the second one is the initializer function that you will use to initialize your, um, your parameters. And the third one is the shape of the parameters that are going to be initialized. Um, and, and you see that you don't provide uh, any RNG here. So if you remember that when we call module.init, we pass an RNG. Now Flex will make sure that this RNG is automatically split up and, and, and your parameters are initialized using that RNG in a split way. Um, so params are immutable by convention. I also said that before. And it means that we assume that, that you're not going to modify them. Um, so you also see that the, so the self.param uh, API returns uh, something that's immutable. You cannot change it. And otherwise, you get an error. Um, but and this is what we talked about before. There are use cases where you maybe want to modify the parameters. Um, so how do you do that? Well, for that, you use uh, self.variable. I'm going to talk about that now. Now, a first thing to notice is that self.variable is just a more general version of self.param. Um, so basically, self.param is, ju uh, is just a thin wrapper around self.variable. And self.param creates a variable of the collection param. And with variable, you can use different collections. So here, um, um, in this case, you have self.variable, and you, you have one argument more at the beginning, which is for your batch statistics. And that will just create it uh, uh, of, of that collection and give it a name. And then uh, you initialize the function. And you see here, we, we return a mutable variable. So this ra mean dot value, you're now changing it. So you're, you're modifying it. So that's the way to use these, to create these variables. OK, so um, now we can again uh, call init and apply on this, uh, on this variable, um, on this batch normalization. And now you see, I'm not going to go through all the details, but uh, in batch norm on the fourth line, oh, I think my pointer is actually not working. Well, on the fourth line uh, of, of the yellow block, um, you call apply and now you pass mutable is and you say your batch stats are mutable. And then it also returns your mutated fars as the, uh, the second uh, element of the pair. And then we can we can see whether what is in this mutated fars and indeed your batch statistics are in there. So those have, are the ones that have been changed. And you can use them then as you want. Okay, um, that was a bit about the internals of modules. Um, now for uh, optimizer, we recommend using Optex. So um, Optex is a library for composable gradient transformations. And indeed, composable transformations sound quite a lot like JAX. So it probably works well with JAX, and it does. So it has also a very similar interface as Flex modules. So Flex uses init and apply, and Optex uses init and update. So the way it works, um, on the left, there's an example for standard gradient descent. Um, you call optex.chain, and there you just pass all the transformations you want to apply. And in this case, we use optex.trace. So you, com you, you compute the trace of the gradient with a decay, and then you call optex.scale, and you uh, scale it by a negative learning rate. Now, once you define this chain, um, you, you, update, you, you get an optex state by uh, calling init on the parameters of your model. Um, 
So next, uh, to, to update, uh, so to update your parameters, um, do this in, in, in two steps. Uh, first, you just call uh, uh, update with the gradients um, and the state of the of the optimizer. So again, you see also here the state is explicitly passed and the params of your uh, model, and it returns uh, updates and a new state. And then basically the only thing uh, that uh, optex.apply updates does is um, it will just add the updates to the params. So the params are the parameter of your network and the updates are the, the delta, how they, how they have to change towards the right way after taking the gradients. So that's the, uh, so you can also see more uh, of our, our examples. They also use optex. So we use now, uh, uh, in order to simplify some of the, um, some of the bookkeeping around optex and optimizers. So we use a, a train state uh, helper uh, data class. So it stores a number of, uh, of, of things that are very convenient. So what, what is your apply function, uh, the params, um, and then the state of what kind of uh, optimization you want to do. And um, yeah, we also use this in our examples. Um, so you can also take a look at it there, but we think it makes it a bit uh, more verbose while not making it overly abstract. Less verbose. Um, okay, so that was a bit um, about uh, some uh, Flex code. But if you now want to get start with coding in Flex, um, so the over overview I provide provided were more some building blocks. Um, so to put them together, it may be useful to just look at some uh, some examples. And I would start with MNIST. Um, I also want to say that we are completely agnostic to what data pipeline or tokenizers or what, what you want to use, TensorFlow data, hugging face data sets doesn't matter. For us, the only thing that matters is that you end up with a NumPy array and you can pass it to a jitted function and, and it will still be fast and run on accelerators. Another way, a uh, nice way to get started is look at the hugging face uh, scripts. Um, so uh, they made a number of really nice scripts uh, that uh, don't create further abstractions, but uh, they, they do demonstrate how you can use Flex. Um, and they also have, uh, they also implemented a number of models in Flex, so that's also useful to take a look at. Now here's some, uh, some things we're working on right now. Um, one thing that we are aware of is that it's uh, sometimes difficult to, to debug JAX code. Uh, um, also, yeah, it sometimes just takes a while to JIT compile it. That's one, uh, one uh, thing. Uh, but another thing is that um, because these functions don't have side effects, you cannot print easily outputs. So um, we're looking at how to, how to improve that. How can you print um, debug statements from a jitted function, but also how can we, uh, maybe we don't have to like jit compile everything and it takes a long time. Maybe we can already do some uh, analysis upfront and, and save ourselves some time. So that's something we're looking at. Um, yeah, the hugging face training script, they, they're really writing a lot of scripts. Uh, so I think they have now GPT-2 and BERT and a lot of, a lot of things. Um, I, oh, it is actually gonna be a talk about that tomorrow um, uh, by the hugging face team. So maybe they'll mention that as well. Yeah, we're looking at more end-to-end -end examples, um, reinforcement learning, object detections. If, if you're keen to, to, to help, let, let us know. Um, we're also looking at mixed precision on GPU. Um, this is something that, um, um, yeah, this, this mixed precision is a difficult topic. And um, if you run on TPU, you will automatically run with um, half precision because TPU uses bfloat16. But on GPU, um, this is a bit more tricky and, um, we, we were thinking of how to best, uh, we have some examples where we do this, uh, but there's a number of tricks and things you have to know. So we're now writing a how-to for that. Um, we're also working on easier to use public TPU examples. Actually, that, that they are now already quite in a good state. And uh, also at multi-host GPU training examples. Okay, so if you wanna learn more, uh, here are some links to documentation. Um, the Flex Basics, I think annotated MNIST is also very useful. Um, because MNIST is a starting example and it just explains all the steps that you want to do very well. Uh, we have also a number of how-tos. Here's just one example. Um, th this is an example of how to do ensembling. So you just make a few changes to your code and immediately you can train an ensemble of devices, uh, models, you know, on all the devices that you have available. And we have a number of design notes that you might find interesting if you're wondering why we made certain choices. Um, also on lifted transformations, which I didn't talk about here, but um, lifted transformations are about how to apply checks transformations to flex modules. Um, 
and then we have a number of discussion forums our um github discussions is pretty uh, pretty active so if you have any questions you can just ask it there and we're always happy to uh, to help out so i think that is uh, the end of my presentation and thank you all very much for um listening thanks so much mark um, this was really great. I think your and, and Sky's talk are super, super good preparation for, um, for all of the community members that are joining the community week next, next week um, and are actively working on projects. So really, really helpful. Um, and yeah, great that we have the recordings will be uploaded soon to YouTube. We have uh, a lot of questions and a lot of, again, really great discussion in the chat. Um, I think we have a few minutes Maybe, let me see where we can start and scroll back a bit. Um, let me start with the first ones. First ones are a bit high level. You mentioned it when you talked about the Linen API. Um, you studied like different kinds of things. Why and when would you prefer Flux over Haiku, for instance? You said you um, upon it, yeah. Oh, you know, I, I actually didn't mean to say we, we improved upon Haiku. I just meant to say that we, we looked at all the libraries and then kind of made our own choice, what, what we thought was best. Um, um, I mean, I, I think Haiku is also a great library. And um, we're actually um, also uh, talking with DeepMind about, uh, we have recent things where we talk about uh, um, ways in which we work together, like Optex is an example of that. Um, so I, I don't think we explicitly, uh, our goal wasn't explicitly to approve upon Haiku. There were like a couple of related questions on performance on GPUs uh, and some like comparisons were shared, um, some links. Uh, okay. Um, oh, Avital shared these comparisons. Yeah, so what was the question? Uh, how, how is it performing on GPU if it is also faster? Yeah, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy Avital shared those numbers because it looks, it looks actually really good. Um, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, you can you can look at, at those numbers. Um, so we, we looked at uh, language modeling and um, text classification, and there it was actually very fast. Uh, we compared it also with PyTorch, um, but we have to of course say that PyTorch was running in full precision training. So um, and and there's probably many tricks you can do to to optimize PyTorch. Um, but but this was just like a comparison where we also didn't do any tricks to optimize uh, Jax. We just ran it. As it is, um, and we ran uh, uh, PyTorch as it is, both in full precision, and it was it was quite actually it surprised it that it was so much faster. So we thought it was interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, knowing that Jax maps to NumPy, someone says, uh, would Flax be uh, in terms of level abstractions more like TensorFlow level abstractions or Keras level abstractions in general? Um. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not really sure because there's also different versions of, 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 uh, of TensorFlow. Um, like I said, we don't want to um, have, have our own trainer abstraction. So we, we want to have the user to have control of their, uh, of their own uh, trainer, training loop. And we want to have as few as practice as possible. Um, so then I, I guess in, it's, if it's, it's closer to TensorFlow than, than Keras because Keras is built on top of TensorFlow. Um, I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, yeah. Cool. We have a, a comment on the Linen API. Um, yeah, it's beautiful and elegant and seeing it for the first time, really liking it. So that's... Um, Thanks a lot. Good, good that's feedback. Nice to hear. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right, what else do we have here? Yeah, maybe more technical questions. Um, let's see, can you elaborate on automatic shape inference? Um, does that have to do with VMAP? Um, and this whole no 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 it it just no it just means that we we do lazy uh, initialization so um, <clears throat> for each module and all the submodules uh, we don't construct anything we don't construct any parameters until we know the shapes of your uh, of, of of what your uh, what your input is going to be so um, when you call model dot init you pass the you pass the shapes of your input and and. And that we used to derive the shapes that we need later uh, for all the params. So that, that's not that it doesn't have to do anything with uh, which text transformations. It's just some, just a feature of flex. Great. 
And let's see. That's still a lot. <laughs> Someone um, asks, uh, since PyTorch will soon have B BF16 support, will Jax soon too be able to run with BF16 on GPUs? Um, yeah, I mean, Jax, I, I, I think you can um, probably do it if you just set uh, the deep type yourself. Um, that's also what, what we do in our example. But um, I, um, I don't know what, what Jax's plans are there. But um, so we, like I said, we're working on this uh, this how to, where we try to explain a bit more how to how to do this for for Flex. And maybe Sky can answer. Yes, good point, Ali. I don't know. I just uh, asked to unmute if she wants to comment on that. Sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, shall I repeat it? Um, since PyTorch will soon have BF16 support, will Jax2 be able to run with BF16 on GPU? Oh, that is a good question. Um, I am not 100% sure if we support BFLOAT16 on GPU either. Um, yeah, if someone wants to post in the Slack channel or even open a GitHub issue, um, then we won't lose track of this because we can ask someone who will know the answer. Sounds good. Let's do that. I think there's like still a lot of questions to cover and I, I'm afraid we have to move uh, to Slack, but maybe one last uh, positive feedback. Jax Pi Tree utility is amazing and applicable way beyond just Jax code. So uh, that's really great too. Okay, um, then I'd like to say thank you um, to Mark. Uh, if it's okay, we'll just, uh, maybe also save the chat history here uh, on Zoom to have it later on. And uh, let me just see if I have muted you. Oh, yeah, it does seem so. Mark, are you back? Uh, oh, am I am I now unmuted? <laughs> yes, you're unmuted. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I muted myself. So, um, oh, my, no I just want to say that my comment on on B float sixteen on GPU was was not accurate. I was thinking about float sixteen. So, don't listen. Just listen to what Sky said. There was. <laughs> Okay, cool. Yeah, as I said, I think both talks were amazing and, and such good prep for, for next week for all of the projects that are coming up. So thank you so much, both uh, Mark and Sky, for your talks. Um, You're welcome. And yeah, yeah, cool. And I think it's time for, and we're like perfectly on time. Look at that. Um, let me just quickly unmute Pablo. Um, if I can find you. Um, there you go. Thanks everyone for your patience. I think it should work now. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. All right, let me just share my screen. <clears throat> Pablo is also part of the you... Google Brain team and yes. you'll be talking about dopamine and reinforcement learning. Yeah, and Jack's box, um, of course. Yeah. Uh, so hello everyone, my name is Pablo. As a, 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 I'm going to be talking less about, um, you know, the internals of Jax and Flax. I'm not a Jax Flax developer, but I, I'm a user, uh, active user and enthusiast. Um, so I lead the, the dopamine project uh, in within Google, which is a library for reinforcement learning research. And uh, so last year um, we added Jax and Flax support to dopamine. And so I want to talk about that a bit and, and why we made that decision and, and sort of the advantages we, we've uh, gotten from that. Um, Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, Dopamine is a, this open source library released in 2018 um, for doing reinforcement learning research. And I know there's many of, of these types of libraries around. Um, we weren't really trying to reinvent the wheel, but what we were aiming for um, was uh, something that we call throwaway research. So you can imagine different research pathways when you're doing not just reinforcement learning research, but, but uh, in general research. Um, so one pathway is running testing hypotheses, right? So you have double DQN, which is already a published uh, RL algorithm, 
um, and you want to test out um, whether how it how it uh, handles uh, what, what policies it produces. And so you can run whatever library you like that has uh, this implementation, and then um, draw your own conclusions. Another type of research path could be something that's an algorithmic variation of an existing algorithm, where it doesn't the code changes aren't too too severe, and you know you can implement this pretty easily on whatever package is available. Um, and then you can figure out whether it's worth continuing down this path. But the, the research path we were interested in is what we call throwaway research, where you're really trying kind of wild ideas um, that are, are hard to implement. And they're not that simple to just download a, your, the library that has, has it implemented and, and tweak some things. Um, and the, the issue with this is that a lot of, most of the time, most of these wild ideas don't work and you end up throwing it away. And that's why we call it throwaway research. Um, so if you have to invest a lot of time into learning a new library and sort of getting familiar with it, um, you might not uh, follow this research path because it's just too much of a time commitment. And so our, our intent with building dopamine was to try to make this path, this research path, um, a little easier for people. And um, so really what we were building it for researcher, researchers and a little selfishly, we were really building it for ourselves because we wanted um, this library. We, weren't completely satisfied with what was available at the time. So um, that's why we decided to build um, this and in the hope that it would also help people, um, which uh, it seems like a lot of people in the community have been using it. So as I said, we wanted to experiment easily with, with wild ideas. And so at a very high level, this is kind of what dopamine looks like. Originally, it was just uh, uh, coded to run on the ALE, which is this benchmark we use in, in reinforcement learning. Um, these are 60 Atari games. And so this benchmark is, is um, where the DQM paper, the, the seminal DQM paper from DeepMind in 2015, this is the benchmark they used. And this is really the, the paper that kind of kicked off uh, the DeepRL um, community that, that is so large now. Um, so basically at, at, at a very high level, we have a runner, which is what's actually executing the, the, um, the running code. Um, this is different. Reinforcement learning for those that aren't familiar uh, with it is a bit different than, than standard you know, supervised or unsupervised learning where you have a data set and you're training off of this, this static data set. In reinforcement learning, you have a, an agent that's interacting with an environment, in this case, in this case a, an Atari game. And so the data set itself is, is what the agent collects as it interacts with the environment. And so it's a little bit, the dynamics are a bit different. And so this is what the runner is intended to do to basically ask the agent, what action do you want me to perform now? Execute it in the environment and then log things and checkpoint uh, your parameters so you can restore things. And, but what I want to focus on in this talk is this, these components over here. So we have our agent, which is basically what's making the decisions of what, what uh, joystick movements to make, what actions to take. Um, and it makes use of uh, something we call a replay memory, which you can think of as the data set. So this is a, just basically a memory buffer where the agent is storing all the experiences that, that it uh, has received from the environment. And then it can sample batches from that to perform its learning. Um, and so when we originally wrote uh, dopamine, it was in TensorFlow, TensorFlow version one. Um, and so I, I, what I want to do now is kind of go through some of the pain points that we went through in developing dopamine, um, specifically with, with the version of TensorFlow that we were using at a time. So when you see this, uh, this red bubble, um, that those are the pain points that I'm trying to highlight. Okay, so um, I'll start with the DQN agent, which was this uh, agent that was introduced uh, by DeepMind in 2015. Um, so we have our, our class definition there. And when one of the, the difficulties that we had or, or uh, that, that wasn't as easy as we would have liked to do is, is in building the replay buffer. So uh, this is uh, the code that's actually building the replay buffer. And you can see it's, it has this weird name. It's called wrapped replay buffer. So obviously, that suggests that it's wrapping something else. And uh, I'll go into a bit more details of, of what that means. Um, so the replay buffer is not just a memory. It's not you know, a first in, first out or something like that. It's a special kind of memory where you store things, but then you sample things from this memory um, randomly. So you have to have some type of sampling. And it also, you're, you're filling it out as you interact with the environment. Um, but when during training, you don't want to start sampling until the replay buffer is filled up to a certain amount. And it's a replay buffer that, that loops around. So when you fill up the buffer, it has a fixed size. You start overwriting things at the beginning of the buffer. <clears throat> And so when you add things to the replay buffer, um, the code is not completely trivial. It's not just a question of doing append um, and then taking a slice so that you maintain the same size. We have to do some logic to make sure that, that we're still uh, adding things correctly. Um, we have to do some padding. And these are technicalities of, of the way we do uh, this type of RL training that I don't have time to get into now. Um, 
but the sampling is is really what what is quite uh, complex. Um, and this piece of code, it's I mean easy enough to write in write in Python, but in TensorFlow one, uh, in order to make this run efficiently, we had to put this in graph. And so that was really hard. Um, we, we tried and it was just making the code way too complicated for our taste. Um, again, coming back to this uh, motivation of, of having uh, a library that was really easy to, to tinker with and, and, uh, and try wild ideas on. So what we ended up doing is rather than trying to write this in graph, which was really difficult to write and debug, um, we created this wrapped replay buffer. And so what this wrapped replay buffer does is it has um, an internal memory, which is actually this, this other replay buffer that I was mentioning before, where, where you have all this, this uh, funky logic that you need. And then we wrap it in, um, in this uh, NumPy function. So basically, this takes a, 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 fun a Python function and makes it uh, executable in graph, in the TensorFlow graph. And that's how we got around this, this issue of um, writing code that's easy to digest and modify, but still having things run in graph. So it's not as efficient as if we would have written it directly in graph, but um, that was the trade-off we made in order to, to be able to try out uh, wild ideas. Um, so it was it did result in more interaction. It is a bit more com uh, complexity because now you have to sort of trace through, am I talking about the internal memory or uh, members of the of the wrapper class and that type of thing. So this was actually the, the replay buffer was something that we heard a lot of feedback from people that they found it a little difficult to, to manage. On the DQN agent side, um, coming back to, to the DQN agent, again, because we were running TensorFlow 1, we had to construct our training ops um, prior to actually running the training. And so that's what we were doing in this uh, build train op. Um, so the code wasn't too complex, uh, especially for DQN. It's, it's a fairly simple um, training operation. But what made it difficult is that debugging this was hard. Again, because you're, you're building this, this operation, this op, um, prior to running the training. And so if you're trying to do anything like print debugging or using PDB, um, and you do uh, add a print statement to our PDB in this, in this uh, operation here, it won't work. For those of you that, that have worked with uh, TensorFlow 1, you know you have to add this tf.print that um, you assign to the same variable you're trying to debug. And it was is a, a little messy. I think uh, with uh, TF2 and eager mode, it's a lot simpler. But at the time, this was quite a pain for us to, um, to debug. But um, we did it. Uh, we managed to, to get it working. Uh, and it worked really well for two years. It's what we've, we were using for all our research. And it still works. A lot of people still use the TensorFlow version of dopamine. Um, but then Jax came along. And uh, I, I, you know, I started noticing on Twitter people really praising Jax and, and how flexible it was um, and how easy it was to, to write out complex uh, operations and, and have it something that runs efficiently, but but is easy to to digest, um, and this seems to to go really well with the philosophy of dopamine of having this flexible but powerful um, library, and so I, I uh, we started working on on uh, Jack's versions of all the the dopamine agents, and so this we launched uh, last year, um, and we added an extra agent that wasn't available in the, in the TensorFlow code, um, and so I want to kind of go through a little bit of, of the steps we went to to implement these these uh, agents in JAX and sort of some of the things that uh, were a little, um, not confusing, but but new for me um, in the hope that it helps people in the community um, get into JAX and, and but also why we're still using JAX. And, and actually for me, it's my um, tool of preference for, for doing research now. I don't really use the TensorFlow versions anymore of dopamine. Um, one of the things I wanted to, to highlight is profiling in JAX that I've I found extremely useful. Um, so basically, you can write your JAX code and then run this profiler, and that allows you to figure out where you have bottlenecks. So if, if something, if your code is running very slowly, I've been able to find a bunch of things where, where I've been able to optimize the code. And so using the, this profiling tool, um, I was actually able to get the JAX version of, of dopamine running at the same speed as the, the TensorFlow um, version. Uh, one really cool thing, as, as Sky mentioned, is that now that we have this JAX version of dopamine, I can just run it on TPU um, without any code changes, which is not the case uh, for the t TensorFlow versions. So if you want to run dopamine TensorFlow on TPU, you have to write new code, which we don't have available. Um, so that was something that was really um, appealing to me. And I have run some experiments on TPU, but most of the time we're still training on GPU. And this is mostly due to um, the nature of the type of RL research we do. OK, so let's go a little bit into the JAX code and, and what it looks like. 
Um, so again, I mentioned one of the big pain points we had with, with TensorFlow in the initial version was the, the replay buffer. Um, and so we have this wrap replay buffer that we had to, uh, that was necessary in order to add this NumPy function so that we could have things in graph. Well, we no longer need it uh, with the JAX version. So with the JAX versions, we can just deal directly with this um, Python uh, class that we created that has all the funky logic and there's no indirection. So that just made things a lot simpler and easier for people to understand and debug. Um, on the DQN agent side, uh, we replace this uh, op that we create once before we execute the graph with this um, train function. Um, so obviously there, there are some uh, commonalities in the sense that um, we're, we're jitting this as, as was mentioned before. So this will create a compiled version that uh, you, know, you don't continue executing. But in debugging, uh, what I found really useful is I just comment out the, the jitting and then I can actually step through the code as you would with, with regular Python. Um, one thing that, that uh, took me a couple days of <laughs> debugging was uh, that the, the train function, uh, Previously, the, all the train ops were, were members of the class, of the DQN class. Um, but in JAX, we had to create this, this global train function um, for, for it to work. Otherwise, uh, it was creating weird uh, issues with, with the state um, that I will not try to explain because I'll definitely uh, do a bad job doing that. Um, but uh, another thing where, where I spent a little bit of time is, is making sure I, I get this, this uh, jitting uh, correctly. So. Um, Jitting, as, as was already mentioned, is, is just in time compilation. And so in order to really get this running properly, you want to basically um, make sure that any arguments that are static, so for instance, um, gamma, which is a term we use, a hyperparameter we use in reinforcement learning, um, it doesn't change at all through training. So you can specify this as being something static. Same with the network definition. Once we create the network definition, which I'll get to later, um, it doesn't change at all. And so getting this right really helps uh, speed up uh, the, the execution of your, of your uh, training. Um, VMAP, uh, which was already discussed, this is something I found extremely useful. Um, and I'll, get, I'll give some examples later. But basically, we no longer have to write code um, that's explicitly dealing with the back, batch dimension, which is something we had to do with the TensorFlow code. And that made it a lot more complex than, than we would have liked. You can write this as if it's a single example, which um, for some of the RL code that we use uh, makes things way simpler. And then you can just wrap it in a VMAP and, and things kind of work. Um, uh, finally, one thing that at first I thought was a little painful, um, but I actually have learned to appreciate it quite a lot, is that you have to be really explicit about the gradients and the params that you're using. Um, this, I, I again, at the beginning was a little uh, weird for me because with TensorFlow, you know, I just do tf.trainable variables and send that to the optimizer and, and it would do things, but uh, and hopefully it's doing the right thing. But if you have, you know, multi heads or something like that, and it's not clear where the gradients are flowing through, um, I guess that they're doing the right thing, but it's a lot simpler to, to introduce uh, training bugs in that way because you're not being explicit about where you're, you're uh, making the gradients flow when you're doing training. And as you, DQN is not that, that complex in architecture, but when you get into things like soft actor critic or something like that, where you have multiple networks that are sort of combined, and sometimes you train one, sometimes you train the other, you have to be really explicit about where the gradients are flowing. And so I, I really learned to appreciate this um, requirement of, of being explicit. Um, okay, so I, I mentioned VMAP uh, was, was something that, that was really useful for simplifying our code. And so I wanted uh, to give an example um, of this. So it, one of the algorithms that, that we have in dopamine, or a few of them, are based on what's called distributional reinforcement learning. Again, I won't go into the details here, but basically instead of having backing up a single numerical value for each state in action, which is how the agent uh, chooses what, what actions to take, to take um, we're maintaining a distribution of values. So this is obviously more complex, um, but it's a, a method that, that's proven to be quite uh, effective at uh, getting better learning uh, performance. Um, and so if we look, one of the, uh, in the original uh, distributional RL paper, paper by my colleague, Mark Belmar, um, one of the, uh, the, the way they implemented it was having a fixed uh, uh, distribution support. So you can imagine this like if just between, I don't know, negative one and one, and you have uh, a fixed number of, of bins, so it's a categorical distribution. Um, you have to essentially, when you do the, what we call the Bellman backup, which is essentially computing a, a target that's leveraging your previous estimates, um, that might end up shifting the distribution of your values outside of your distribution support. And so in order to make things work, you have to sort of project it back into um, your distribution support. And this is what this 
all this code is doing. So a lot of it is comments, but the reason they're there is because um, we had to deal with the batch dimension explicitly, which made things really hairy. And um, again, in the spirit of trying to make this easy for people to understand, we have a running example that showed you, you know, how the, the matrices are changing, where the batch is, and, and that type of thing. Um, it was pretty hairy uh, to get right, but uh, we managed to get it right. Um, but it, it, made, it was made a lot more complicated because we had to deal with the batch dimension explicitly. And as you move things around, the batch kind of goes into different dimensions and you have to uh, make sure you're doing things right. Um, with JAX, uh, you, you have something, this is it. <laughs> this is all the code. So all those, those two columns I had before, um, you, you uh, essentially can write it exactly like this. And so we still have comments. We're pointing to the paper function so you can look these up, but the code is a lot tighter. And the reason it's like it's this uh, concise is because we don't have to deal with the batch dimension, um, which just make things a lot um, easier. So VMAP for the win. Um, okay, so now I wanna go a little bit into networks that I mentioned uh, uh, I wanted to talk about. So up to now, everything has been JAX. Um, for the networks, we've been using Flax and, and Linen. Um, so I wanted, again, to give you an example of how uh, JAX, Flax, and Linen have helped us um, you know, make the code simpler and, and easier to use. So I'm going to use implicit quantile networks, which is a, a, a type of distributional uh, reinforcement learning, where instead of using a categorical distribution, they're using a, a different way of parameterizing the, the distribution. And I won't go into the details here, but it's a fairly involved uh, methodology for, for updating this distribution. And so the, the network itself requires, um, this was done with Keras. Um, when you're creating the network, you know, this isn't too, too bad. You just have uh, three conv layers and then two fully connected layers. The tricky thing comes when you're actually um, trying to do the forward pass in this network, because again, you have to deal with the, with the batch dimension here. Um, because this, this uh, IQN is, is a little involved, um, you have to explicitly be aware of where the batch dimension is and sort of fold it into these operations carefully so that it, so that it works well. And this actually took us quite a bit of time um, to, to get right. Um, one thing we do uh, with dopamine is have unit tests for everything. So that, that helps us um, you know, validate, confirm to ourselves that we're doing the right thing. And also for the community to know it helps. It's a form of documentation in itself. OK, so this is the Keras code. Um, again, batch said, the batch dimension made things really complicated. With JAX, we have something like this. So we no longer have to uh, create the network and then have a special um, way of dealing with batch dimensions when we're doing the forward pass. We can just use the, uh, the compact decorator of Linen and um, specify our network. Again, it's just three conv layers with two fully connected layers. And then the, the complex IQN operations, uh, we can code them up as if we don't have a batch dimension, which just make, makes things a lot easier um, to deal with. Again, the map for the win. Um, so I want to come back again, uh, just before finishing the talk, to, to the, the tweet I had where um, we really felt that uh, JAX, the, the philosophy of JAX and, and Flax and, and, and all of this, this community is really about enabling flexible research, but without necessarily sacrificing uh, efficiency. And this goes really well with, with the dopamine philosophy. And so um, I just wanted to highlight uh, two recent papers that, that we have out um, that, that were really enabled by, by JAX. So a lot of the experimentation we did there um, was non-trivial and it was made a lot easier um, by the use of JAX and Flax and Linen. So the first one on the top, Revisiting Rainbow, this for those of you um, that will be joining ICML, we're going to be presenting this at ICML. Um, and the bottom one, we put this up on uh, archive recently. This is using um, state metrics to uh, learn better representations for RL. And this paper in particular, the, the operations of doing this the state metrics representation learning is pretty involved. And I think it would have been a lot more, I know it would have been a lot more complicated to do this in, in, with the TensorFlow versions of dopamine. Um, so there's other stuff that uh, unfortunately I can't share with you because we haven't made it public yet. That's even wilder. <laughs> uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to share it soon. And, and really, I think uh, part of the reason why we're trying out these wild ideas, a lot of them are working quite well, is because of the flexibility that, that um, JAX uh, and Flax enables. So with that, um, I'm glad I'm, I'm done a bit early. So if there are any questions, I know I really had to skim over the RL details. Um, I just kind of wanted to give a high level overview of, a, of an end user of JAX Flax and um, how, how, we, uh, how this has enabled even more flexible research. So again, check out the, the, the repo. Um, we're actually actively working on it right now. Uh, it's sort of a, a spring cleaning of sorts, even though we're already technically in summer. 
Um, but we'll be sharing some new updates and some new goodies that I think the community will like quite a lot. Um, so stay tuned to that. Awesome, thank you so much, Pablo. I really like it, um, you know, having the flexibility and uh, yeah, to try out wild ideas, wild research ideas, that's always a good thing. Cool, uh, we do have a few questions actually. You mentioned maybe again, like a very high level question. You mentioned um, the TensorFlow versions compared to Jax, you mentioned TF1, how, how is it compared? TF1 was without eager execution, how does it relate to TF2? Um, good question. Uh, unfortunately, dopamine right now is not yet TF2. Um, it's, uh, so dopamine is not my 100% job. <laughs> so I'm a researcher as well. So a lot of my time is spent just doing research and writing papers and things. Um, the team has sort of shifted, not shifted, but fluctuated the number of people that are actively working on dopamine. Uh, so we've sort of had to leverage, you know, 20 percenters and things like that to help us out. And there was somebody that was working on the migration to TF2, but that person, person unfortunately had to shift to different priorities. So it's still something we have there. Um, my impression is, is uh, from some experiments we've run is we won't get too many more gains than we already have uh, switching to TF2 with Eager. Um, the performance will be roughly about the same as what we have with TF1. And as I showed, like, that performance is, is basically the same as what we have with JAX. Cool. And uh, you said that you mainly work on GPUs with dopamine. And mm -hmm. someone asked if there is a multi GPU support, multi node training out of the box. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we have looked into this and we did have an internal version um, that we were trying out with distributed training with multiple GPUs. Um, the difficulty here is it's not as simple as, as just running the same code and training it, or the same algorithm and training it on multiple GPUs. When you switch to the multi-GPU setting, your algorithm changes. So you have to deal with, now you're dealing, what does it mean to have um, multiple GPUs? Uh, well, if you're doing learning um, uh, in parallel, um, you know, there's algorithmic choices that you have to make about how you combine uh, the gradients from, from the, the parallel learners. If it's just the actors interacting with the environment, um, that's a single step they're all taking, which can speed up things if you're doing things in parallel. Uh, but you know, how do you combine all this data? Uh, again, it's an algorithmic choice. Um, the re do they each have their own replay buffer? Uh, what size is that? Or is it a centralized replay buffer? So there's a lot of algorithmic choices that end up um, changing the algorithms that, that we're using. And because most of us, what we're doing is, is what we call fundamental reinforcement learning research, where it's um, really starting from the, the mathematical foundations and, and building up into the deep RL setting. Um, moving into these distributed settings, although they, they, you can train things a lot faster, it's harder to maintain the connection with the theoretical results that we develop when we're building, when we're uh, developing new algorithms. Um, and, and for the distributed uh, setting, there's also other teams at Google that are doing this really well, like Acme and, and things like that. Um, so again, the intent is not to have uh, a library that um, suits all types of research. We're really focused on this one type of research, which is the, the wild exploratory ideas. Obviously, you can't try wild ideas with distributed setting with dopamine because we don't support that. But um, you know, it's a trade-off that that uh, we've we've uh, decided to make. Cool. Um, there were a few questions on distributional reinforcement learning. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, just like your your view on it. If you could share some resources, I think somebody uh, shared like a, a paper by DeepMind, just a general distributional perspective on yeah, I'll share, I'll put learning. The, um, the, the original paper that I mentioned here, which has the, um, the uh, distributional, um, uh, the distribution is, is parameterized as a categorical distribution. And this is the paper that introduced uh, distributional RL. Um, there's been a number of uh, follow-up papers. So IQN that I, that I mentioned, um, I'll add the, the link here in a bit. Um, I don't know if there's uh, yet a survey uh, of, of, of the, these types of methods. Um, more and more, it's, it's uh, becoming kind of standard. Um, so Rainbow, if you, if you know of uh, the Rainbow paper, um, this part of one of the, the main components of the Rainbow algorithm was uh, distributional RL. Um, 
And uh, I think the, the original paper does a pretty good job at, uh, at explaining it. I mean, it's pretty mathematical, but uh, I think that really builds it up from the foundations up and, and exemplifies how it can help in, in deep RL training. Nice, thanks so much. Um, let's see. Maybe one last question. Could you maybe repeat again the benefits of VMAP compared to TensorFlow? Yeah, so um, with TensorFlow, so part of the reason why we, we are able to now train these, these big models in, in RL, um, uh, so 10 years ago, uh, we weren't doing this. We were running on grid worlds and, and so very small toy environments. Um, and what allows us to, and, and deep learning in general, what has allowed us to to grow these networks is, is um, training with specialized hardware like, like GPUs and TPUs and things like that, where you can run operations in, in parallel. Um, so this means that you're uh, no longer using a single example. For instance, for RL, we sample transitions from a replay buffer. Um, in the old days, what we do is just look at a single transition and use that to update our, our uh, estimates of the value function. Um, so single update, that's fine for, for small um, domains, but if something in something like Atari, it, it's pretty inefficient. And so what we do is we store things in a replay buffer and then we sample batches from the replay buffer. So that means if you think of these transitions as being a vector, now you have a matrix, right? Where the, the rows are the, the batch um, indices. Um, so in TensorFlow, the difficulty with this was that uh, because we're receiving a matrix um, and a lot of the operations that we're doing, they're matrix operations, but they, they end up sort of mixing um, the indices, so you don't always keep the batch uh, dimension as the first uh, dimension of your matrix. You have to be really careful with, with doing reshaping and, and things like that. And so, uh, I mean, there's tons of memes about the, these shape mis mismatch errors. Um, and that's something we, we face a lot because uh, we are doing these, these uh, complex matrix operations um, and we have to make sure that we're always keeping the batch dimension where it should be. Um, with, with VMAP, uh, we can kind of code things the way we would uh, we would have coded things uh, back in the old old days where we only had a single example, which is a lot easier to deal with because now you're, you're only dealing with a vector as opposed to a matrix. And so we can write our code in that way. Um, so we don't have to worry about the batch dimensions or where it is because that's not a thing in, in our code. And then we just wrap it with a VMAP and um, it sort of handles the batch dimension uh, transparently for us. And so it just makes the code a lot easier to write and, and read. 